Morning all. I'd like to show you a brilliant game. It's actually a correspondence chess game from 1919. And the beauty of correspondence, of course, is uh, more attention to detail. And these games are really worthy of study often uh, because of the absence of major blunders. It's not like a, an over the board game, even. It's like a blitz game compared to a correspondence game. Uh, which makes these games, you know, repeatable in the same way, for example, a brilliant Hitchcock film might be repeatable viewing, like Rear Window, for example. The amount of detail, attention to detail, and um, if there's opportunities, they're seized often in brilliant fashion. Uh, th this game uh, between Henrik Wagner, uh, who was uh, a kind of Olympiad player before the, even the official uh, Olympiads, or actually just after the time of the... Um, unofficial Olympiads. Henry Wagner playing white was in the German Olympiad team of 1927, 28, 30 and 31. Uh, so often uh, great correspondence players were great over the board players. Uh, that was often the case. And his opponent uh, was also playing for Germany in the second unofficial chess Olympiad of 1926. So just one year before uh, his opponent actually, so the second unofficial 1926, so, and um, okay, only one of them was awarded the IM title though, it was uh, to the player with white, because he came uh, third uh, after a keeper Rubenstein and Bolojobov in uh, Breslau 1925, and many years later Fide awarded the player with white the IM title. So anyway, let's have a look at the game. So Henrik uh, Wagner playing white plays d4. And we see something very interesting for correspondence chess. Uh, after c4 we see the Albin counter gambit, which you might think should be reserved for blitz or over the board chess, but it was actually uh, quite often played um, in correspondence chess uh, as, as an experimental kind of gambit. So let's see, d takes e5, d4, uh, knight f3, knight c6. Okay, now white plays knight bd2, and black plays very, very aggressively here. And it's a move uh, I actually often like to play in this kind of system, f6. So rather like the Morris Smith gamut where a knight is, is gaining development tempo, here black is trying to get this knight to gain an important development tempo. And not only that, we get this f file pressure. But White's decision here is more uh, positional, actually, trying to avoid black having dynamic f file pressure. He just plays actually e6, which works quite well with knight pd2, because that's protecting the pawn in advance of bishop e6, if that's going to be played, which it is played. And now White plays a3, which is often a thematic uh, move here. This knight on c6 is a little bit of a target to b4. Not only b4 potentially threatens b5 in some lines, but bishop b2 would add more pressure to d4. Black is keen to avoid this uh, b4 from white and plays a5. So, so far it looks fairly standard. b3, the bishop still wants to pin Chateau to put pressure on that d4 pawn. Okay, so black's faced with uh, an important decision here. Does he try and uh, work around this f6 pawn uh, with, say, a move like a, a bishop move and then maybe knight e7? Well, he decides actually, more interestingly, to play f5, which does give uh, the knight the f6 square. And maybe the bishop can still come to c5, but the knight might be sometimes more effective on f6. On the other hand, it is blocking the bishop. So let's see, bishop b2, bishop c5, queen c2, and then we see queen e7. Okay, so here white is actually prevented casting queenside because I think bishop takes a3 is playable there. So that's not white's intention. White wants to try and uh, often castle kingside anyway, so g3 is played, and black plays. Uh, a very aggressive move here, 
which not only supports the pawn but um, addresses king safety a little bit one, one would think casting queenside um, the downside maybe uh, is that the king on the queen side is often a little bit more vulnerable but here it seems that the b4 break is ruled out black has got a lot of pressure sealing down b4 you would think okay white's next move is against more specific threats that black might have here if white routinely plays bishop g2 then d3 looks very very dangerous indeed with the king in the center so this next move it's not an ideal blockader to blockade with the queen as Nimsvich would indicate in my system but it's a necessary evil here it would seem to block this pawn from d3 so we see knight h6 there's no easy way of attacking pawn uh, attacking the queen in this position so knight h6 seems a little bit odd wasn't the intention knight f6 what's the advantage of knight h6 well it does protect f5 it might be en route to g4 and then certain dynamic possibilities would arise okay bishop g2 and in fact knight g4 without um, uh, waiting around and also knight e5 is is, is going to be more important uh, more, more meat and potato than any knight e3 or knight f2 here just to get rid of this blockader okay is white concerned now well white castles here but is he casting into a ready-made attack because black's rook on h8 would love to sort of just hack and slay the white king here surely h5 it looks really really aggressive okay now white um if if white tries to defend with say h4 then even even perhaps f4 is dangerous uh, in this position or knight e5 is dangerous uh, it just looks as though this might weaken the white king to play h4 h3 is just maybe asking for things like knight e5 and h4 white actually goes on starts to go on a counter attack here uh, making use of some forcing moves now the first forcing move is b4 okay even though black seemingly sealed against b4 it's playing it anyway we see a takes b4 okay and black is not too concerned at the moment about this a file it's trying to perhaps precisely calculate this a takes b4 is played knight takes b4 inviting positively inviting rook a8 check here but in that case then king d7 and actually for example e5 is is covered by the knight here so after that uh, the rook would have to exchange where would the attack be so white doesn't play a routine rook a8 check white actually plays queen b3 so where is the danger for the black king uh, now there might be uh, something brewing on b4 here tactically at some point for example rook a5 to b5 rook a4 this is looking a little bit vulnerable this b4 knight on b5 maybe just rook b1 bishop a3 it's like a kind of benko gambit with the added bonus that the king is on the queen side this this b file pressure might be enough for the pawn Black actually plays knight c6 here. Okay. And now we see the move queen b5. So this sets up a very useful pin for check for this knight to be pinned, in which case, you know, sometimes after this one's kicked, knight e5 could be uh, valuable. But also by vacating the b3 square knight b3 is also an interesting threat now on the horizon against this bishop on c5 so the bishop feels a little bit vulnerable here this bishop on c5 and plays to b6 okay now here there's a very interesting move indeed it seems black is amply covering that d4 pawn with three pieces here but white plays 
a seemingly amazing move. Bishop takes d4. So what on earth is this about? Surely black can just take on d4 here quite safely. Well, we see actually bishop takes d4. And in this position, knight takes d4. Now here, clearly, knight takes d4 is, is unpleasant. b7 is a problem. So black just plays rook takes d4, thinking maybe this is okay. Surely. Or is it dangerous? Okay, we'll check in the second pass. But this next move uh, looks very, very impressive, uh, to say the least. I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, white plays queen, takes b7 check, believe it or not. This bishop is beautifully placed along this diagonal. Uh, is it worth a queen to emphasize the power of that bishop? Okay, black takes, we see rook fb1 check. Okay, so what's the point here? Surely the king can run like this, for example, king c8. But no, actually, the king is, is starting to be put into a mating net here with this next move. Can you guess it? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, bishop takes c6, just stopping the king from coming out. Now, rook a8 is made to be a very effective threat. Black is desperate here uh, to avoid this and uh, <laughs> plays queen a3, sign of desperation. That's not good. Okay, to try and play, for example, king d8 next move. Because uh, then uh, King e7 is possible. The queen's just vacated the e7 square. It is a pretty desperate resource to try and use here. Okay. Uh, so most of us would perhaps uh, be tempted here to just take on a3. But white plays. Uh, um, even more powerful move, it would seem. I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. White plays rook b8 check. The king is not even given the opportunity for an escape here. The king is dragged back to b8, and now we see rook takes a3, threatening again. Now this mating net, and there's no escape, it seems. No escape, there's no checks. It's end of game, black resigned. So quite a beautiful correspondence game. Let's, let's see with an engine actually how sound uh, this was. So Alvin Countergambit, unfortunately the black king wasn't too safe e6 chosen here, which actually from an engine point of view gives back a slight edge at this, this minimal depth. Okay, so we see f5 and uh, bishop c5, queen e7, g3. Instead of casting the engines recommending rook d8, actually, Uh, that's 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 an interesting option here. If if the king safety is a problem, if if the blockade like this, the knight f6. I think black is doing 
okay, objectively. But um, Black Castles. Actually, even here, B4 might be a little bit dangerous. Queen D3, though, was played. Knight H6. Bishop G2. And again, from an engine point of view, this depth, it looks as though Black's doing okay. H5 looks aggressive. But now we see this change of evaluation with B4. Black takes. What what else is that? If Bishop A seven, then, for example, Queen B three, maybe even C five, just blocking out the Bishop will be good here. As well, simple move. It's uh, pretty bad if the Bishop goes back. So it's taken. And okay, it's a little bit scary that these possibilities are created like rook a8 check. Black takes. Now here, I mean, rook a8 check, let's just make sure that the king going to d7 is, shouldn't be a problem for black. It shouldn't be. It, should be. it seems okay. So, um, in this position, we see queen b3. Which has given us quite a good move. Uh, C knight c6. Queen b5. White well, has an advantage here. It seems technically. Bishop b6. Now there's this move, which um, opens up this diagonal in this position. It looks as though one intuitive intention of queen b5 was. Um, to play knight b3, but that's not really uh, the case here. If knight b3 was was played, um, then maybe black's okay actually with queen, for example, queen b4. Or no, actually, it looks as though white is doing well even with knight b3 because uh, the same tactic is in the game actually. Knight f takes d4 being powerful. So we see it here though, immediately it's, it's almost uh, possible either knight d4, bishop d4. Bishop d4 is played. And um, black took. White took. A huge, huge evaluation ship for this bishop scope increasing here. And it looks, it looks horrendous from an evaluation point of view. Rook takes d4. And also, of course, instead of the brilliancy with queen takes b7, it looks as though bishop takes c6 is very strong as well. Uh, this position is, is simply threatening rook a8, mating. Uh, you might think, well, king d8 for bishop c8. But even here, I think white's technically uh, doing very well. Take here, rook a1, and it's dangerous again. So the same sort of theme is, is cropping up here. It seems the black king's in a natural kind of mating net, but uh, th this move is more aesthetic. Queen takes b7. Appealing to the audience, liking good queen sacrifice. So king takes b7, rook fb1 check. So apparently queen b4 is the move for maximum resistance. It's still, it's still pretty lost after queen b4. Uh, we would have uh, rook takes. That knight's pinned, of course. Bishop takes. And okay, white's material up. Uh, that's that's um, winning anyway. And also, of course, rook b8 check is an annoying threat. It's pretty bad news. But uh, in the game, we saw king c8. And it's actually a false mate in four. Bishop takes c6. Queen a3. And the engine is spotting the mate in three here quite ruthlessly. Not going for rook takes a3. Which would just delay things. Let's just let's quickly see the delay. 
so King the Eight. And uh, there's knights hanging here anyway, so in this position, uh, what's the material like? It's not amazingly massively uh, in White's favour materially. So this this move is an important little finesse to finish off things very neatly. To play Rook, B8 check, drag the King back, so there's no escape. It takes and then Rook takes a free threatening mate, unstoppable mate in one. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little masterpiece in correspondence chess, showing the yeah, Elvin counter gambit as well. Um, hopefully there are some brilliances I'll find. But the Alvin Counts Gamut wins like this. It was an aggressively played Alvin Counts Gamut, casting on the Queen side, taking some risk there, and that was punished. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.